Hello and welcome to this digital panel discussion on the topic of on glass ceilings, the meritocracy and network centering care. This um, digital online panel takes place within the exhibition Mycelia about networking as a female um, artist and is based on the principles of emergent strategy. And just so that we are all on the same page about the topics and the thoughts that brought about this exhibition, I'm going to read you a little introduction about emergent strategy. And I'm quoting from Adrian Marie Brown. Emergence is the way complex systems and patterns arise out of a multiplicity of relatively simple interactions. It is another way of speaking about the connective tissue of all that exists. The way the Tao, the forest, change God, goddess, life. Birds flocking, cells splitting, fungi whispering underground. Emergence emphasizes critical connections over critical mass, building authentic relationships, listening with all the senses of the body and the mind. With our human gift of reasoning, we have tried to control or overcome the emergent process that are our own nature. The process of the planet we live on and the universe we call home. The result is crisis at each scale we are aware of. From our deepest inner moral sensibilities to our collective scale of climate and planetary health and beyond. For a species in relation to space and time. The crisis is everywhere, massive, massive, massive. And we are small, but emergence notices the small actions and connections create complex systems, patterns that become ecosystems and societies. Emergence is our inheritance as a part of this universe. It is how we change. Emergence strategy is how we intentionally change in ways that grow our capacity to embody the just and liberated worlds we long for. So the exhibition mycelia uses the fungus mycelium as a thought model. The mycelium is the part of the fingers that grows underground in thread-like formations. It connects roots to one another and breaks down plant material to create healthier ecosystems. In this network, the mycelium also provides a healthy ecosystem for outside organisms. The mycelium is the largest organism on earth and represents the principles of ecosystem, interconnectedness, detoxification, which are the focal points of this exhibition and led actually to the creation of the, the panel discussion. Based on these thoughts, 10 artists of Munich and Riga and Chi are present right now, explore the layers of artistic success as a woman artist in this neoliberal society. Our society praises the belief in meritocracy, success as a fruit of hard labor, that we, if we look closer into the systemic conditions, Success is highly shaped through class, race, and gender. Artistic success depends on a healthy network. But what does this uh, network look like in a society that puts competition over solidarity? What does artistic success require? What does a healthy artistic ecosystem look like? Now, uh, due to COVID-19, and it has been said, it has, it, it has been a great reveal for many systemic injustices, but to be honest, many of these injustices have been taking place for a long time. It's not just because of COVID-19. So we need to redefine the metrics of artistic success and reimagine better systems for a more equitable art world. And these are just a few of the questions and thoughts around this panel today. And without further ado, I'd like to present our guest in the brilliant minds and having the big pleasure to talk, uh, talk with today. I'm starting with Chris Martinez head of the Art Institute at the FHNV Academy of Arts and Design in Basel in Switzerland. She's also the expedition leader of The Current, a project initiated by TBA 21 Academy. The Current is also the inspiration between Art is the Ocean, a series of seminars, conferences held at the Art Institute, which examines the role of artists in the conception of new experiences and nature. She is currently in charge of a research project at the Art Institute supported by Museum Sush on the role of education enhancing women's equality in the art. Then we have Helen Gurriel. She's an artist, author and editor in the arts with a research interest in gender transnational aesthetics. 
Her doctoral thesis was entitled The Gender Economic and Symbolic Values in Contemporary British Painting. She lectures widely in visual culture, and most recently at the University of Edinburgh. Her new book, Women Can Paint, Gender, the Glass Ceiling and Values in Contemporary Art, uh, was recently published by Bloomsbury, and she currently co-edited a new volume of drawing conversation series. Then we have Greta Lowe. Greta Lowe was born in South Africa, but grew up in Australia. She received her BA in 2001 from the University of Western Australia and honors in psychology in 2002. Subsequently living in Japan and New Zealand before moving to Germany in 2007, her practice as a curator and artist combines questions around heritage, feminist craft technologies, with machine learning image production to explore the embodied nature of the digital. Her focus is on new digital technologies and how they are shaping the contemporary experience. Then we have in two artists who are actually part of the exhibition, Penelope Richardson. She lives and works in Munich. Prior to arriving in Germany, she had studios in Melbourne, Bogota, and Sydney. She grew up in Sydney, where she did her undergraduate studies at the National Art uh, School and Sydney College of Arts. Later, she undertook postgraduate studies at the Universidad de los Andes in Bogota, before returning to Australia to complete her Master of Fine Arts at the Art. RMIT University in Melbourne. And last but not least, Yeva Baloda, who was born in Riga, Latvia, and is an artist and film curator working with analog image. She participates in international exhibitions and festivals, presenting her work both in installation as well as cinema and performance situation. As a curator, she is the founding member of the Baltic Analog Lab, providing a space and platform for analog film production research and education. She's also the director of the experimental film festival process happening in Riga since 2017. So without further ado, let's start. Thank you so much for being here. It's really appreciated in a time where we all have to juggle so many commitments. And um, I would actually like to start with you, Helen, because you wrote um, this absolute fabulous book that has been recently published and first of all congratulations and I'm sorry that it has been come out during a pandemic because I know how hard it is to do book publishing and all the PR work while you're in a pandemic and uh, I'm sure a lot of your planned uh, program has been cancelled so thank you for being here and it's a pleasure to talk about the book and um, I mean your book is a very thorough study and it has a lot of data and connection points and I'm very grateful for that and you know in the art world I see often this strange contradiction between being obsessed with numbers as a measurement for relevance and success translating into the listicles we see in medium in form of top 10 lists and then we have this obsession with people appearing in rankings of the top most powerful lists but then there's also this weird um, hesitation and denial to look into data when we talk about uh, topics of diversity and inequality. And you are very transparent when you talk about that in the introduction of your book, because you talk about the difficulty mm -hmm. to fund actually the whole thing. So can you guide us a little bit into the process, how this book came about, and also how uh, your approach to data collection is part of the feminist thinking? Yeah, sure. Can I just start by saying um, I've started a new job today. So I'm currently lecturing in critical, historical and contextual studies at Duncan of Jordan Stone College of Art and Design, which is part of the University of Dundee. So it's my first day today. So just quickly introducing that. To Congratulations. You <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so in terms of um, the book is basically a rewrite of my PhD. So I'm currently writing the second book, which is called War Paint. Um, and for both of the books I've adop adapted, um, which was quite controversial in the visual arts, is to um, adapt a quantitative um, analysis approach um, to research. Um, I came up across quite a lot of hurdles for this because um, a lot of feminist methodologists uh, I found um, really didn't approve of the quantitative because they found this has been quite a masculine um, form um, of, of research. Um, so there's quite a lot of, um, you know, contestation in that. Um, mm -hmm. But um, I actually took a database of around three to 4,000 paintings 
um, and I analysed 40 different variables in each painting um, and also looking at the artist's gender, race, ethnicity, etc. Um, to, to come out with the findings. Um, I'm happy to talk you through the findings as well, if, if that would help, or unless you want me to do that at a later stage. Um, absolutely. I'm, I'm just going to quote briefly. You, you had in the introduction, you quoted a lot of uh, feminist uh, thinkers you based on and you approached to quote pe uh, people as a form of memory making. And I just want to quote briefly your quote of Nicola Griffiths about data, and I'm quoting here, data is the key. We have the tools now to accumulate, analyze, display, and share easily. Data will show us patterns. Patterns will lead to correlations. Correlations will lead to possible causes. Causes will help us find solutions. And I absolutely love this quote because often when we see data and we see the critical thinking, I find that the next step and to reimagine an alternative is quite a long step. And actually you transform that approach in your book because your book ends basically with a manifesto, with a collection of manifestos and with a reimagining, which is, which is something I really, really appro uh, um, adore and love because hope is um, probably a bigger transformator as hate might be. Yeah, definitely. I think as well um, to discuss the methodology, because I used um, a software package called SPSS, um, which was really, really useful to kind of look at this, uh, look at the arts through the lens of statistics, statistics um, because um, this package enabled me to see patterns that the eye can't actually, the human eye couldn't see. So it kind of picks up quite a lot of details that we, we might not naturally be aware of. So it was definitely a really good tool to use as well in terms of arts research. I'm going to go back to you in the second round when we're talking more about our own approaches of rethinking and what equity means to us. I'm going to continue with choose. Um, there are a lot of things that we can talk about. And I, when I prepared this conversation, there was a whole page I would love to ask you. But maybe we'll start with the initiatives that you are right now committed in as you have so many different approaches to equity in the art world, maybe you can share a few of the initiatives that you are right now um, elaborating on in the Art Institute. Well, they're kind of, I don't know how to start, they're kind of simple in a way, I think. We have this uh, research project going on, which is how to analyze the way we teach and see how we influence uh, how gender is shaped um, and influences artistic production and the network building in the art world in itself. And we do that with the help of uh, Institute Sush, which is a museum and an institute which is also in Switzerland. And um, we organize with Queen Latima a series of open symposiums twice a year, which are like three day long, open to everyone. Um, when, and then that's the moment where we dialogically talk to many practitioners and try to, to address these issues. And then we try to publish and collect also the testimonies of many artists, women artists, but not only. And then we have like very many different platforms. Like this morning, we launched a small production, film production platform, uh, where we are trying to produce films by um, art students, because I think that it's a little bit of a problem that everyone is talking about artists, but everyone is also forgetting that many artists are still studying and a whole generation can be really, really damaged by the whole situation because they, they feel that they don't, they don't have the support, but also they feel that after study, they may not be artists and that the, that's a very critical time. So we launched that and I'm trying to fundraise to do like a small production platform. And then we have a series of um, feminist podcasts that we started one half year ago and then we are continuing with, with new one, also analyzing how the COVID situation is also um, kind of reaffirming and going back in a, to gender roles and to, to, yeah, it's a very masculine time of um, occupying the social media, the voice of biologists. I think it seems that there is no single biologist which is a woman or a female in the planet and uh, all the commentators and all the rise and everything is, is mostly, dom it's, it's kind of after the Me Too movement is kind of very dominated by male. So we are, we are kind of engaging a lot into it right now. So, you know, it's at, at the end, it's very, very simple. It's just trying to uh, produce groups and communities and try to keep them connected, which is mostly the big job 
like try that people is in the same room, even if separated, having this conversation or keeping it alive and producing simple platforms where many can join and ask and, and we can also try to support because all these uh, film commissions are paid. So the idea is to, to give a little bit of support um, to, to those and then writing. So I do a tale a day in Instagram. So it has been my curatorial project just to, to storytelling. So things like that. One of the things that I've been thinking a lot about is um, the notion of curation and care. And one of your um, panel discussion symposia has been women in space. And you have been talking a lot about how women take up space. And one of the discussions has been around um, wearing differing hats. And you did recently uh, an interview with Marti Maneng for the ADES, where you talked about um, your different commitments and how many different positions you're holding and how your perspective of a curator is sort of um, being interconnected. Mm -hmm. And just to give a little uh, quote about what you answered about how you uh, what your perspective as a curator is. So um, being a curator as uh, the interconnectedness of nature, gender, ethnicity, any decision like collaboration with TBA 21 also has to be included in that uh, speculative scenario in which what matters the most are the values that connect artistic production with respect for life, for the values of nature and with the horizon of a world in inequality. Everyone who works with me knows that the Institute is not something that can be separated from any other aspect. My ideal of life is the interlacement of ideas and of those who make them possible. To socialize everything has always been a goal for me. I come from a small town, um, ending the quote. And I would love to hear you how the notion of being a curator has changed for you throughout the time and how you relate that with your notion of caring. Yeah, I think that when I was younger, and I, I suppose that perhaps the other panelists also share similar experiences, the, the art world has been, is very hierarchical, but also is very into creating orders, like primary, secondary, and tertiary orders. Like the most important things, of course, to be a curator in a big institution, then there's the independent curator, then comes kind of the artistic mass, and then um, you know, the art schools and every other practitioners that do other things, they are secondary to all these big orders. So, um, and I was kind of operating in it in a sense that, not that I believe on it, but it was, I couldn't see, um, I felt all the time trapped. So, uh, you know, when Daniel Binbaum was the director of the Stedel, everyone asked him, what is his view on education? Uh, when I took at uh, the art school, everyone is asking me, how is my teaching? I don't teach, but it, it, it actually, it always goes into this idea that we are more service providers and that uh, as uh, it's very difficult to find your voice um, in a curatorial, let's say hybrid strange way. I think it's very difficult, you know, to be um, a curator. I don't even believe on that. So you are a practitioner in many levels and sometimes it means that you are cooking lunch for your kid but also thinking about what to do in a seminar or in a policy in a team and uh, you are also thinking about an exhibition but also in a text or in a platform or try so and exactly that polluted role is what interests me. I really don't want the clean one. I don't want to be um, anything else but it was I think years ago I was always very conflicted and very difficult to actually explain it, describe it, and then it seems that you give up something. How come choose that you give up creating? I never give up anything. First, because nobody give it to me or to any of us. It's not that we, we have like an inbox full of uh, invitations where we are um, invited to be, um, you know, in advisory boards of, uh, on top of top of roles. So we, we are not, as a woman, you don't do that. I think almost everything is self-initiated. And there is very few other ways and mostly everything that happens is because some of you friends and and so on think about you and then contact you but it's just not coming out of the cooperative mind in that kind of pure um, cascade of invitations from up to, to down so in that sense um, i must say that this crisis and before 
um, it's for me very liberating. It makes it even clear that I don't really care about uh, this old fashioned way of establishing what our function is. And I can transit many functions with certain amount of relevance into those roles. And, and therefore I can help many people. So for me, it's just, my jobs are always divided in between platforms where I can just not do anything for anybody, Museo del Barrio, no penny. I couldn't invite a single person. I could not pay a fee. I could not do anything. And places like here in Switzerland and in the Institute where I can help many. So, and I prefer the second. So I give up the honor and I, I would like really to, to be um, in the company of many and trying to see who else also can do something for somebody else. And I strongly believe on that. And I learned that from artists as mostly female artists, but it's true that that's what I learned in my contact with uh, artists doing exhibitions in the informal talks. This is what artists want and, and would like to have as an art world. So, and um, yeah, that's kind of the I answer. agree with so much of what you said and thank you for the transparency. And um, I do agree that people often confuse the prestigious world with the messy in between where you are just doing the things that you mm -hmm. care about and you connect them to the values and Greta I know that you are wearing a lot of different hats as well and in your recent long-term project an riesigen schwarm or a giant swarm the piece is sort of a long-term thinking a speculative futurist envisioning of new life forms that are adapting to life and thrive within a post-Anthropocene environment. So you're sort of rejecting the regular hero's journey and looking into a more interconnectedness. Can you share a little bit more about your approach to that world scenario and how it has been influencing your work? And you need to just uh, unmute your mic for a sec. Okay, here we go. Enough. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so, you know, for me, it was really uh, quite, an, quite a, an organic um, process that led to that worldview, <laughs> as you're sp speaking about. I mean, obviously, a lot of it comes from, from the research and the reading that I've been doing um, and, you know, utilising the, um, the sort of networked model and the... the this focus on the kind of the interactivity of um, different actors in a situation, human, non-human, and also, you know, the, the networks of care that come into that. So there's a lot of, you know, other thinkers that have gone into that. But also for me, I mean, it's just literally um, quite a, a sort of gradual process of, of reading a lot of science. You know, I, I did a lot of research um, should I say something about what the work is? Absolutely. I'm going to also leave um, a link in the description box for the yeah. one channel installation that you uh, did recently for a project to work mm -hmm. on so that people can just view it. Okay. But, yeah. So, so basically, the Anim Riesigen Schwarm, a giant swarm, it's a, um, an immersive installation, multimedia. It's based around a six piece fragmented narrative, uh, a sound piece um, that people can kind of dip in and out of, that's the idea. And then there are various aesthetic um, parts to the, to the installation that sort of creates an immersive mm -hmm. feeling of being in this particular environment. And it's very much looking at post-Anthropocene oceans, particularly as a sort of case study in a way for the interlocking and interwoven effects of um, human action and interaction with the environment of agricultural runoff of um you know pollution and and um plastic waste uh lots of these these different ways that we as a as a species interact with our environment but then it's 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 really working from that point of view of looking at the ecosystems that we touch and that we interact with as active participants in that in that situation, in that interaction. So rather than the idea that, you know, humans have created a certain Anthropocene um, or post-Anthropocene polluted environment, and then the, the species that are affected by that are sort of passive, um, 
you know, victims of that, it's, it's much more looking at the action that those species take. And, and one of the really clear examples that comes out of that is jellyfish in the oceans, because they, you know, they are so um, benefited actually by most of the um, practices that humans are currently engaging with that are damaging for a lot of other species in the ocean. And I think it's a, it's a really fascinating example to look at from this point of view of thinking of ourselves not as kind of masters of the universe who can kind of, you know, kill and also save at will, but that we are engaged in a sort of constant interaction with the environments that we are living in. And, you know, we are obviously expanding more and more into, you know, further um, environments, which is also really an underpinning of the current situation that we're in as well with these zoonotisha um, pandemics. Um, yeah, and so I mean, really, once I kind of delved into that, it was very um, natural that that it came to be this this sort of understanding that there can be no um, understanding of that interaction that we have from from this kind of modernist heroic notion that you were talking about, Annabelle. I mean, it's just impossible to think about about that because it it it, it presumes a sort of omnipotence you know, or, or an understanding of everything that we're doing, which I think clearly we do not have, you know, and it's, it's, it's out of reach to any species or. Um, I've been so thinking a lot about the hero's journey. I mean, we had so many conversations about that in the past and I really appreciate your whole thinking around um, how we can actually find a systemic and a, and a form of language and visual representation about this network theory that is not just centered around one, one key element that's sort of rhythmatic, um, having, having different threats that are open and are not never ending. And I think one of the big things that um, we have been thinking a lot together is that the hero's journey is so deeply embedded in our capitalism, needing heroes to perpetuate extraordinary human effort. And it relativizes human sacrifice. And I don't know, but right now, in this language of the pandemic, people have this weird impression that it's a very productive time for creatives because pressure sort of alchemizes into creative thinking. And I just think it's um, a really screwed up way to not show the privilege and how sustain risk and handle risk is actually part of the privilege we are all holding. And I know that you have a lot of thoughts around that. You wanna, do you wanna share some? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think you've you've really um, sort of described that. I mean, uh, uh, for me, particularly in the beginning, it was really paralyzing, you know, just um, to sort of think about what what this crisis means for for my networks, and also what what Chus was talking about. You know, these these kind of relationships that we develop that end up being, you know, we we knit our own safety nets as we go. And, you know, when you've been working for a while, you, you have started to kind of be part of somebody else's safety net and also to, to pull them into yours. And so you create this like shawl around yourself to keep you warm. And these are the times where we see that those can unravel very quickly, you know, and when a few key people maybe fall out of that, you know, obviously I've had like everybody else exhibitions and things that have been canceled. Some of those institutions and galleries that I was working with may never reopen, you know, and, and so that, that is then, you know, it's not just a matter of postponing um, projects. And, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm very aware of my relative security also living in Germany at this time, but um but still you know i'm very reliant on other people that are in within my networks um and yeah i mean i think we're kind of seeing how those can be um endangered very quickly and i think in general this is a time where you know not just as artists but as as a species you know we are being exposed to the myth of the safety bubble that we had you know formed around ourselves whether that be in terms of a biological safety of, you know, medicine and, and uh, hygiene, keeping us safe from disease. I think it's clear that that's, that's not the case. Um, you know, and I think that this is very much, you know, part of, part of uh, that understanding that when we interact with the environment around us, 
whether it be ecosystems or you know biological materials whatever it happens to be it interacts with us as well and there are follow-on reactions from that and you know that's that's what we're, we're dealing with now and we will continue to be dealing with on an ongoing basis that's actually a perfect bridge to the work that Penelope has been doing because i mean you can also in the playlist of this video you can see a whole artist conversation with Penelope we'll be talking a lot about her work for the exhibition and um, we've been talking a lot about um, the environment and how the environment shapes actually the conditions for success and you have been working with for the exhibition at least with exotic plants and I mean exotic is not a neutral term we are very aware that it is sort of a othering of the person and usually it implies a lot of hierarchies can you go a little bit deeper into how environments shape success in your thinking and how your artistic practice that has been dealing a lot with exoticism and also with uh, yourself as your practice has been uh, shaped through a lot of your movings and how you had to restart again and again yeah thank you um i think um yeah, the work I did um, for the uh, Marcellia exhibition is um, very much, I'll just explain it a little bit. It's um, um, I'm working with my partner. We were looking for a sort of a connection and we took it, uh, the connection from our work. And we noticed that both of us work quite um, often in the painting in the expanded field. And um, we both had been using a lot of natural materials and trees and things in our work. And um, I was, I've always been very interested in um, how uh, spaces and, and moments in history define um, maybe a give birth to something and they define things as they go forward. Um, um, and we, that we forget maybe that this, some, this moment of sort of birth has, um, given definition to something because then we live it and we don't see it and so in the in the moment of um working with sandra strela we started to think about systems and me being in germany i've been uh, totally interested in this um residue of the national socialists um here in 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 particularly in munich and the buildings and things that are left and something that um as also a sort of a residue it appears to me is this use of exotic plants um, in a sort of bureau uh, office um, interior decoration and so um, with the Sandra we started talking about this idea of the plants as this sort of invisible actual living thing that's there and witnessing and taking in sort of absorbing um, environment and and um, culture and ideas though it's never spoken to or, or um, acknowledged maybe in the space it's just there yeah? and then we started thinking a little bit about this um, idea of the plants and the same in the Soviet um, communist uh, they had the similar a similar relationship to their um, environment with this exoticism and you know, why why in this very strict uh, sort of culture do then they include this exotic um, element what does it really mean um, yeah so we started thinking you know this is perhaps that's the represents the woman or the unspoken on um, so, you know the thing that is allowed to be there but not allowed to have a voice in the particular culture or, or moment and that then these things sort of the trees are still there or the plants are still being used in the same way um, in offices and they they somehow stay in the memory of people maybe as and it's interesting because you sort of question who has the monopoly over um, the othering of what is home to something what is natural in the environment and i mean the author authoritarian regimes have the monopoly about defining who gets to thrive in the environment they create and actually um, decide about uh, who, who gets the, the success or the voice or whatever. And uh, it's a very interesting way to talk about power and the way. Do you, do you think um, 
the environment um, that shapes success is something that we can change, sort of? I think it maybe um, changes. It, it can change. I don't, I, I mean, I don't know. I was thinking about this idea of the environment, that this environment and change and what, what, what's changed and, and in the, maybe not in my lifetime, but before. Um, I was thinking, okay, there's, in the past, this environment, success, success, what is that? You know, for in woman artists, it's different to a male artist. Um, and what's allowed and what's expected or, yeah. Um, in the past, um, environment of success in, is opportunity. It's a possibility to have connection. It's a possibility to have a voice. Um, it's a possibility in the external, let's say outside your studio to um, make connections and to show your work and to have discussions like maybe what we're doing right now. This is, this is um, a really great um, way, maybe forward for success, but um, it's not um, maybe the only thing, I mean, it, Success is also, um, for me, for instance, thinking, okay, I've, I've managed over my whole career as an artist to keep making art. And even when I've tried to stop making art because it doesn't make sense sometimes, I then have found that I actually keep making art anyway. Yeah, and, and, it's, and that's, for me, with all the changes, a sort of a success, a sort of a, what do you call it like that that's something that a way of maybe processing ideas that's important to me is this process of being an artist um and the ideas can often be very different because life throws different things at you and so then the yeah it's very true and i think um it's actually a good bridge to you Yeva. and you need to unmute your mic as well um i think we I mean, in our artist conversation, and again, it's also in the playlist uh, accompanying this, this video, um, your work deals a lot with this notion of sisterhood and solidarity and this shared moment of togetherness. And I mean, I think in the art world, the, the, we like to pretend that we care for community. At least that's one of the mission statements that a lot of museums try to build. Then there's also the reality that community needs to be defined. We cannot serve everyone because then we do not serve anyone. And um, I know that you have been working with different audiences and different sort of communities. How do you relate to this moment of togetherness? Well, uh, first, first of all, I think um, togetherness is, is also um, it's equal to, to uh, w wanting to be together <laughs> and uh, willing to, to listen and to, to, uh, to share. Um, and, and also, this also comes to the, to the freedom. I think freedom is also very essential to be allowed to express yourself and, um, and uh, regardless of your gender or, or nationality. So, so that's yeah, that's another important thing. And then, um, yeah, just with, when I was working with Zilke, who was my partner in the Mycelia pro project, um, what we found, both found out, is that um, key, key element to, to start working is actually to expose your vulnerabilities, as we talked in our conversation. And I think this is very important in, in both in artistic practice but also in human relationships once you are um, courageous enough to open up to the other person then I think this is already successful conversation and I think many times nowadays we're not allowed to be uh, vulnerable because we're always expected to very to be very strong and to be very um, successful uh, in many ways <laughs> But sometimes we do fail and sometimes we are very weak and sometimes we cannot come up with the ideas and and sometimes yeah we're just stuck um, but I think it's it's important to to uh, 
to be open about this and, and to, yeah, to expose your vulnerabilities. And I actually, actually we did, did manage to do this with Silk. We were both quite open from the very beginning. I was about to, to talk about your project because you were one, uh, one of the artists who was actually quite brave because you did a, a quite a big experimentation as you actually brought us some fungus on uh, projection slides. Do you want to go a bit deeper into how you took the risk and um, how you created sort of an experimentation lab for the exhibition? Uh, yeah, so... Um... I've been, to be honest, I've been always very interested into biology and um, I had some other projects where I wanted to start to, to grow something um, on the film um, because I work with analog film and analog media. So I, I just thought, okay, I'll try to, to grow fungus on the, on the film. I had some good friends who helped me um, with some suggest suggestions and advices. Um, and I just applied, I had some, like the, uh, it needs some sort of like feeding. So I was feeding the mold. I, I got some different, like, actually it was also a kind of interesting project where I asked on Facebook, my friends, maybe you have something rotten and you could share some uh, mold. And, and many people, uh, yeah, they helped and they gave me their kind of cans of uh, rotten food, fruits or, or maybe some jams and stuff. Um, yeah, and then, then I just applied this on a film and uh, of course I did not know like how is it going to go, is it going to work or not. So, so I also, what I did is that I also took photos of the process of the mold growing on the film um, of the fungus. So, so I kind of had backup so that I have, you know, at least that. But it's, it's nice, I, I really like to use um, I like to use failures in my work also. I like to, because it's, when you're an artist, there is no, um, there's no way to create something if you're not experimenting and if you're not uh, exploring something, you know? And, and for me, that was, it's part of the work to, to be in a process and to try out things. If they fail, then you kind of learn from it. So, and I like, to, to use these uh, also imperfections and failures sometimes I just because I learned I, I discover something from, from the process and that's actually something I really appreciate about your work because the whole exhibition um, when we talk about success and network we also have to talk about failure but what does failure mean in art and that's something we always relate to back to quality we always think about good art and bad art as if quality is such a a big metric and I mean criticism is nothing is something we apply we apply the terms and the metrics on the quality of art it's not a set term there is not such a thing as bad art and I think it's an interesting thing when we talk about criticism and also the collection of data and how we assess failure is uh, as metrics to collect uh, data and how that's maybe something that we can relate back to to the work you have been doing and um, the reimagining of the data collection points because you found out a lot of the things that we might be aware of and I think when we talk about feminist practices and diversity work people are aware that things are are quite unequal in particular in the art world and it's interesting that there is still this impression just because there has been a bit more research and a bit more open awareness that people have the impression that it gets better but if we look into the recent data and into the recent studies like women in the in the us for example there was a huge study done just 14 percent of female artists do get large-scale exhibitions in the museums so i mean the, the numbers are there you know like it's nothing um that we, even though we are loud about it, it doesn't change. So how do we raise the awareness from the data collection into actionable steps? And I mean, you have some ideas in your manifest. Do you want to guide us along? Yeah, sure. So in the final chapter, and um, this was after my PhD and my postdoc study. Um, so I looked at things that would, could possibly help change the art world um, and, these, and to bring equality about. These are things that um, could quite easily happen as well. Um, as, a, as a lecturer, um, 
I, I wrote a paper recently for the um, Arts in Society and I did a, a big scale study of fine arts students across the UK um, and we found that only 20% of the artists students were being introduced to were female artists so there was an absolute complete some people um, couldn't couldn't actually name even five female artists um, which was really quite alarming so they didn't have any um, role models with which to be able to perceive themselves in the future which is a massive holdback um, so the paper I wrote um, for the arts in society was to encourage um, hopefully through the QAA and um, uh, the people at government um, arts degree programs um, hopefully across globally um, is to encourage lecturers to really think about the um, artists and um, they're proposing as role models through contextual studies lectures etc um, um, I mean if we look at Gombrich's story of art which is um, the most widely read art history book um, in the world I think at the minute um, there's only one woman artist <laughs> there's only one woman artist in the in the most the latest version out of I think 380 pages which is really quite shocking in today's day and age when everyone assumes that we have equality. Um, the other thing that I, I, I was considering was um, we have, for example, the Tates in the, in the UK. Um, I think it was two years ago, there was only 13% of the budget was allocated to work by women artists. Yet there was an awful lot of press coming out to say how much the Tate were doing for women artists. So um, on the surface of it, the public thought very much that uh, the Tate were devoting a lot of money to women artists but that wasn't the case at all so it was to encourage um, museum diversity policies to be fully inclusive and take account of gender um, the problem with gender is it's very often assumed to be a neutral category so people um, in terms of the policies people are looking at race and ethnicity um, and also age but gender's just kind of discounted because people assume that we're equal um, in 2020 when actually we're completely not um, <clears throat> The third issue was um, to look at the introduction of gender quotas or caps in group shows um, and the number of solo shows um, in galleries as well would be to encourage um, more female artists um, to be represented by galleries and also um, to look at almost if we're looking at group shows where we've kind of got I looked at a group show once uh, recently in the Czech Republic and there was I think 18 prominent male artists and just two female artists. So the female artists were almost being, um, it, the perception was that it could be a tokenist inclusion of their work. Um, but really that they should have been looking at a more 50-50 um, balance in my opinion. Um, media and museum PR responsibility is a really underlooked thing as well. So PR public relations. Um, so for example, again, if I go back to the Tates, they've received significant media attention um, for their generous exposure um, of women artists through the press, but actually um, it, women artists are, are very, like I say, very low in the collections. Um, and also through that is to stop calling women artists women artists because men artists are just called artists. Um, so we kind of like assuming that art is actually a masculine practice as well. And I'd love to see that stop. Um, I think a certain call for art world regulation um as well because we've got such an opacity in the art world um at the minute so i, I interviewed quite a lot of high profile um prominent women artists um, from across the world for the book um one of them had just been dismissed from the gallery just because she was pregnant because the gallery perceived that because she was going to be a mother that she would be no longer focused purely on the art because she'd have other things to do um, so this, uh, she couldn't do anything about it because she said if she did, no other gallery would touch her at all. So she was kind of just being dumped on the side there. So it was uh, to call for proper art world regulation, I think, to have a greater transparency. Um, I think feminist and fine art methodologies to embrace more quantitative research, which is slowly coming in, like we, you kindly quoted um, from Nicole Walsh Jouvre there and um, it, it, it does bring wonderful results um, but I think certainly in, in the field I work in it's quite a rare thing to look at the arts through uh, the lens of numbers um, and I think also more funding finally more funding to investigate and find solution to art gender inequalities um, there's so few people um, in terms of either philanthropists or higher education institutions that are willing to 
fund um, any research. Um, so I've put in quite a few um, proposals for extra postdoctoral funding to try and um, you know, make progress in art gender equality. And to my horror, I found that when I, one of my funding bids was declined and I found that they'd taken on a project on Victorian brown shoes found in wardrobes between 1984 and 1986. And I was really horrified because I thought this, you know, like that would only be of interest to a very minor number of people, but something like gender equality affects everybody because an equal world is a happier world, obviously. Um, so it's really important that we, we keep pushing forward um, to make a change. I really appreciate your actionable steps because I think that there is, it is difficult to come from the moment of criticism and demands into um, approaching a hopeful future or approaching actionable steps and transforming what we want to see more of, right? Sometimes we have to just create what we want of and uh, try to bring in as many people as possible to us. Um, what would a more equitable future look like for you? And what are your conversations with your students around inequality and diversity? Um, so this is for me, isn't you it? You need yes. also to unmute yourself, hold on. Yeah, there we go, you're back. Okay, so you ask about the conversations with my students about that? Right, well, exactly. It's something that is worrying um, all genders. Like, it's not only a concern of uh, <clears throat> of my women stu students, uh, but but it's true that women are concerned in a different manner than men uh, about different subjects. And um, it's also a structural thing. We talk a lot about the the transformation of the structural conditions, like for example, the language that we sometimes wear. I think we repeat questions of scale and intimacy and care as if this is the realm of the woman, while the rest of the values in the planet are more universal. And then um, we kind of leave too much inside that. And then to kind of share those values with others or even trespass this realm uh, to you know, non-binary and, and male students would be very useful to to learn how to actually wear other types of languages and values to address uh, the practice of women artists. And I think that, in that sense, I cannot agree more with Helen. But um, yeah, it's it's a it's a difficult task to to really produce structural transformation and try to. Uh, talk otherwise, act otherwise, because it's only by behavior that these things will change. And definitely a little bit of pain and pressure, because I think who is going to give up, um, you know, um, your benefits if you are not obliged to. So it's a, it has, it, it is always a very lively uh, debate, but it's one that everyone is concerned because it's also the inclusion of all these conversations into the traditional idea of what political is and political art is and political ideology is and how these issues have definitely not been there. And that's also because of the language that we have been using. So to transform the language means to transform the behavior and also to uh, send let's say, to produce a different substance, political substance, that may be of use for future generations. I think we can really not fight in the future as we fight in the past. And, um, and that's, a, that's a, complex, a complex thing. And nobody actually would like to be cornered or to be part of any... Um, I think young artists are very concerned about being perceived in a corner of a conversation. They want to be part of the world. And uh, it's also interesting how with age to discover that, and, and it's like this, this eternal return of the discovery of the same is also something that we are addressing a lot, like how to make that return different, a, a little bit different. Every small gesture counts so that uh, actually a little bit of a transformation happens in the returning as well. So that's more or less how we have been working on it. I'm, I'm very glad that you talk about the ageism in the art world because I think we have a weird impression 
that success is something that you achieve in a very young age or that you have to achieve in a very young age. And then we do not understand that the starting metrics are very different for the people. Like I'm the daughter of immigrants. So um, my starting conditions are very different from someone who has already a bonding network mm -hmm. and is born into wealth. And um, I think, Helen, you have mentioned that in your book as well, that a lot of the art prizes and um, fellowships are uh, in this weird age gap of 35 years and younger. Mm -hmm. And after that, you just do not exist anymore. It's a weird misconception. And um, Penelope, I know that, I mean, without exposing you, but um, once you, you reach a certain age, it becomes more difficult. Do you have a few thoughts on the ageism in the art world? Because we've been talking about that quite a bit, right? Yeah, I, I mean, I've been thinking as I've been listening to what everyone's been saying, um, interestingly, as a young artist, I was um, in quite a lot of exhibitions and, and curated things, uh, prizes, prize shows and things like that. I won some scholarships and as I went on, um, these it seems like these opportunities are less and less um, and also then suddenly you get over the age of 35 and you can't apply for anything anymore and you're still making stuff and then you wonder well okay um, then 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 you have to just rely on your resilience um, and say what what what's it about is it a, what am I doing this for who's it for is it for uh, is it for outside is it for the audience or is it do I do it for me or what's valuable people spend a lot of time writing or doing things for themselves which later then come out um, yeah so the, the the age thing is is an interesting one and lately I've been um, feeling a little bit that um, that you start to get become sort of non-existent in a certain way but then um, it's non then you're not non-existent because you're keeping on making stuff yeah and that's that's a form of existing and and form of um acknowledging yourself and the need to do that sort of stuff but it would be interesting um i'm, I'm sort of waffling a little bit but um listening to this i think um one thing that struck me is that it's something that as an artist you can't be everything you can't be out there being the politician fighting the changes because that's something you sort of have to work on so many levels just to keep your life together and also to earn a living to pay for the studio and all of that so it's sort of like a, a double life you're already leading um and what's really interesting um, from what I've just heard is this equi hearing that other people are out there fighting, like the curators and things are also out there pushing this agenda for more equality. And, and like Helen said, the, with this um, structured idea about how you can create more uh, equality, um, then that means I have a feeling of, okay, well, I'm not alone in this because you can feel alone and say, okay, well, I'll just stay here in the studio and focus on this because it's too, just such hard work to just go out and also be the politician and 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 fight and and uh, make contacts and you know those networks are very sort of tenuous anyway and whatever. So, um, first you wanted to reply. Yeah, I was just wanted to say that I think you are very right and we need to be very very kind of aware of it because um, ageism is also very related to how certain individual lives are perceived only for the sake of energy and the release of a certain energy into the system which is a highly highly racist Darwinistic um, idea uh, to say the least so that uh, at the beginning of your life you release some sort of input and then you produce a dynamic but you are not actually value as an individual but only for the release of those energies into the system the inputs the influences the dynamics so it's a really um late 18th century beginning of the 19th century ideas very very problematic so we are full um to something but after that uh, you can pass it on or you can reuse uh, other individuals but i think um, and I think that this is something that we need to introduce very consciously in the choices of everything we do. Like I've been having these discussions, for example, every time we hire somebody, 
uh, in the institute. It's fundamental to hire people that are, you know, almost 60. And if they want to change the job and apply for something, they are in. And that conversation is a really interesting one to have. Uh, should we take that into account? Uh, why don't you don't take somebody younger? Why to take somebody younger or not? I think if this is perfect for the job. And then all these concerns and how we are socially shaped around it. I think the opportunity that they, we think we are wasting. So we ourselves are totally into that language of gaining or wasting because using that energy thing, which is very Nazi, I think, excuse me, but it's so interested how this ideology that was previous to Nazism, of course, was there, but it has been really consolidated into, into the ideology of the 40s and on, and we never get rid of it. It's still there because it's something that, of course, entangles itself with modernism and everything you want. But of that, I am really, really uh, conscious. And with the COVID, more so. I think I already announced that the next semester is all about the, I think every invited person needs to be in the risk group. I think I really want to address that in a very upfront and, and radical manner because Otherwise, we are going to be, you know, the consequences of this add to a process that already started and nobody knows how to stop. I think, of course, we know, but they are not stopping it. So, um, I think that's a very valuable thing that you touched upon this uh, romantic ideal and this very broken promise of meritocracy that a lot of labor and a lot of sacrifice will lead to a merit and a reward. And I think we've somehow inherited this uh, weird belief and it's a very toxic belief because no amount of sacrifice will um, transform toxicity and will transform and lead to systemic change. And as long as we perpetuate the notion of sacrifice and the tormented and starving artists in the art world, we won't change anything. So if we do not talk about labor conditions and creating a healthier environment for the whole system of the art world, we won't change anything. And I think mm -hmm. it's such an important thing that we talk also about COVID-19 in this regard, because one of the myths that um, pressure creates creativity is something that I find is a weird narrative that we are finding ourselves in. And you touched yesterday just briefly in your Instagram live about the topic of residency and how solitude is somehow something that many believe will lead to creative outputs. But maybe we can talk a little bit about this toxicity and in regards to the pandemic and the pressure <coughs> to create something. Greta, do you have a few thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it's on so many levels i mean i think one one part of it is part of the kind of hamster wheel style of living that we've all been um sort of bound to and there's this sense that if that stops um you know we we stop and and think something crucial ceases to exist so there's this idea that we should always be pushing forward in some way and filling that time in some way and i i really noticed in the beginning and i know that you did too annabelle and we spoke about this um this idea that, you know, every, all the shops were shut down, the, the you know, shopping centres were shut down, museums were shut down. And so this kind of compulsion to consume was somehow shifted very quickly into a kind of um, digital consumption of material. And so we were, especially in the kind of arts, we were, you know, expected to be producing a lot of digital material and also consuming it at the same time. And every museum, every gallery suddenly was offering a digital walkthrough and um, there was this expectation that we would sort of quickly, you know, move to that form of consumption. And I mean, I for personally, and I know a lot of others felt the same way, I was, I felt completely allergic to it. You know, I felt that I, I could not consume anything. I could not push anything more into my brain. I was already so sort of filled with, you know, so many of the, of the systemic thoughts and you know concerns about other people um and and just the sort of total lack of of any kind of planability for the future um i didn't really feel that that was a, a, a producive a productive time for me at all um but i will say that you know something that's a, a transformation that i was feeling in my pro in my practice before that has certainly been strengthened by this is um a turn towards um 
I mean, you've called it heritage and I have too, but to these kinds of ancient forms of craft. So, you know, I started making things with, with textiles and embroidery a few years ago, and it's something that's really been, you know, super enhanced through this time because it is something that fits into a daily life and into a kind of domestic reality that most women, especially if their parents still face today that, you know, you have, domestic duties, there are things going on in your home, you have relational duties, you know, there are, there are relationships of care that do not allow for the kind of production that is encapsulated in this modernist idea of the artistic genius, the solo artistic genius. And, you know, I think that there is something that's, you know, the, the, the woven nature of textiles um, is something that for me at least is inherently kind of conducive to being done in a kind of woven life, you know, and in those, in a life that is rich with those woven responsibilities and inter-responsibilities. Um, and, you know, um, I don't know what the outcome of that will be. I mean, none of us know what the outward is going to look like in a few months or in a couple of years. Um, but that's something that is definitely interesting for me. And, and, you know, now I am starting to feel like, oh, actually, this is really productive. And I am starting to sort of settle into some kind of, new temporary normal whatever that is um but yeah i mean it's it's i don't feel that you know this that the expectation um to sort of produce some new masterpiece right now or to sort of um you know come up with some solutions or something like that i feel that that's also it's again part of that sort of extractivist patriarchal modernist um notion of a hero's journey as opposed to you know um thinking with these systems, thinking with the difficulties that we're having, trying to um, find a new mode maybe of, of looking for solutions, whatever that might be, and, and understanding that none of those solutions are going to be pure in any way. All of them will be problem, problematic in every sense. Um, yeah. So to wrap up the, the session, as we, uh, in one hour, we won't solve the systemic issues. That's not the purpose of this whole exhibition or this whole panel discussion is just to have a few connection points and to think further along. But Yeva, to finish with you, like you've been thinking a lot about solidarity and togetherness and the notion of sisterhood. How did the current situation um, around COVID-19 change your impression of community and togetherness for yourself and your personal practice? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So what I learned is that, um, of course, it was a challenge. I, I, I like to uh, I like to be present as all we all of us. We want, want to communicate and we want to meet. But in this case, it it was not really possible. So we had to come up with some ideas um, on emails. So we were just writing emails to each other and we had to express our thoughts um, uh, by writing and. Yeah, it somehow it was working. I, I'm, I mean, it's kind of like supporting this whole idea of that now we can do everything online, which is not true, of course. But um, yeah, like all this situation really helped us to think about other ways of communication and, and also producing works. And um, yeah, we, we also, as a curator of this uh, Baltic Analog Lab, we all our practice is analog and and we are always teaching workshops so all of a sudden we couldn't do anything because uh now like many i was many institutions were doing things uh, digitally we we just we didn't know what should we do because people have to touch the film and they have to do something but then we we came up uh, with the with the with a project that next week we are going to allow people um we will do live live stream uh of processing films using ecological um, materials that you can find at home, which is uh, a coffee, uh, flowers, vitamin C, soda, and a beer. So, uh, yeah, so at least, you know, and th this, this, so by this, uh, saying this, I, I, I'm saying that uh, we really managed to find some other ways of uh, engaging with the audience. And uh, yeah, I think, I think it was actually healthy for at least for me it was a interesting challenge to to meet and to um, to try out thank you so much and thank you to all of you thank you for this moment of togetherness
in this complicated time. It is a, a, a conversation I'm really appreciating and I hope that we're gonna carry that out, especially with you, dear viewer. So um, share this video and my personal plea, you know, corporate algorithms are pain for the creative work. Just share this video, share the content of creators you like. Write maybe the creators out there. We all face different hardships right now and um, you connect bonds through sharing and caring for the work of others. And uh, so my personal clue, you reach out to people. We would love to hear from you. So if you would like to uh, leave us a comment below or write us an email, we would love to hear from you and your thoughts around artistic practice, the glass ceilings and meritocracy. It's something, a conversation we create together. And so thank you again to all of you. And until next time, thank you. Thank you.